Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, shall we wait for five minutes or should we get started? As you wish. Okay. Whatever the house rule is. Um, okay. So, thank you all for coming here today. Um, for those of you that haven't been here before, um, the Cambridge Much List was established in 1891 and we're a prestigious politics, culture, and debating society. The Indian Much List was established in 1891. Now, the Cambridge Much List. Renamed. Um, you know, we claim the Indian Much List from the 1891. Uh, and we've hosted some of South Asia's greatest minds, um, including Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, and President Emeritus Amartya Sen. And now, Dr. Tharoor, of course. Um, and for those of you, I mean, I'm sure he needs no introduction, but uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor is a distinguished Indian politician, renowned author, and former international civil servant. And his impressive political achievements include serving as the Under Secretary General of the United Nations, um, India's Minister of State for External Affairs and a Member of Parliament, among other things. And he's also recent, recently published a biography on uh, Baba Saheb Ambedkar to add to his illustrious career as an author. And we're absolutely honored to have him here with us today. Thank you. Um, so we'll begin with about 30 minutes of questions from me. And sure. uh, then we'll open the floor to the audience. Uh, again, we're really excited to have you here today. Thank, Thank you, you, you so much for joining us. Good to be here. Um, Okay, so uh, to begin with some questions on the general election. Oh, um, <laughs> we don't know when that's going to be yet. <laughs> okay, um, so with the general election, um, you know, that's coming up, there's a lot of hopes and expectations around an opposition coalition. Um, and given the instability that some coalition governments in India have had in the past, um, what do you think, uh, you know, what is Congress's strategy going to be for creating a united and competent um, opposition coalition. Well, we'll still have to see. There are discussions going on. I think the principal opposition parties, about 20 of them, are getting together in Patna on the 23rd of June. And I think everyone will be reading the tea leaves afterwards, seeing what comes out of that. The concept is based on a certain amount of mathematical logic, which is that the last two elections were won by the BJP with a minority of votes. In 2014, they won uh, 282 seats with 31% of the vote. And in 2019, they won 303 seats with 37% of the vote. So that means there's 63% elsewhere. But we have 46 parties represented in Parliament, which explains the fact that you have so many different voices being heard, which is a good thing. But it also means that votes for one party might have been undercutting another opposition party and thereby making it possible for the BJP to win with less than a majority. I think one has to complicate the mathematics further by looking at the number of constituencies where BJP candidates yeah. actually got more than 50%, where the strategy would not be viable. The discussions are that somewhere between 300 to 400 seats, potentially, um, could be won by the opposition if they were to agree on one candidate against the BJP. Now, that's easier said than done, because in many, many places, uh, two opposition parties are each other's principal opponents and dislike each other more than they dislike the BJP. And that is a challenge. There are uh, a number of states where there is a dominant yeah. uh, non-BJP party. It's not always the Congress. In about seven, eight states, it's principally the Congress, but there are usually one or two smaller parties as well. In states like, say, Bengal, where the TMC is dominant, or Telangana, where the TRS is dominant, BRS now is dominant, or Andhra Pradesh, uh, where two regional parties are contending, um, neither Congress nor BJP is seen as a credible contender. And those are the areas we've got to sit down and come to some sort of working accommodation. I think that uh, a lot will depend on how the, because, uh, you know, it's not enough to have the maths right. You've got to get the chemistry right, too. And the chemistry between the various parties, the various leaderships, uh, that's not always been particularly amicable because there have been tensions and rivalries in the past. So we'll have to see. But there's, there's a certain logic to this approach, and where the opposition doesn't undercut each other, they should stand a fairly good chance. Okay. There's also no doubt that, you know, there's always been in Indian politics a certain level of anti-incumbency amongst the electorate. Because, you know, whenever you have a government come to power, at some point you'll sit up and ask yourself, what have they done for me lately? And that's true both of state governments and of national governments, which is why <laughs> India has a pretty high rate of rejection. That is... The last study that was done said that um, 
I think in the Lok Sabha, only 26% of the MPs were re-elected. <laughs> now, that is not a high number. And uh, therefore, there's always a certain potential churn. That's one more thing to be looked at. So there are a lot of variables that one has to bear in mind. I would say that there is a prospect um, of change. Uh, at this stage of the election, were tomorrow, my guesswork is that the, um, the government would probably still be the largest single party, the ruling party would be, but with a reduced majority. And that reduced majority could be anything from 220 to 250 seats. But, you know, in a parliamentary system, if you're the largest single party, the president will ask you to form the government, and you can always go and twist a couple of arms of fence-sitting parties and get them to support you and form a government. So, as of today, I wouldn't say that, um, that the BJP has to worry about losing power, but they will certainly, I think, face the prospect of losing their majority. Soon. Um, following on from that, um, what do you think is going to be the impact of Rahul Gandhi's suspension on the next election? I mean, seeing as it is, you know, the weakening of democratic processes, do you think this is something that the international community needs to be speaking about more than they are? No, you know, India is not a great place for the international community to speak about domestic matters. Uh, after a couple of hundred years of foreigners speaking for India, you know, when the Indian delegation to the League of Nations was led by an Englishman and so on. Um, I think that Indians feel that they spent an awful long time waiting for themselves the right to settle their own problems, determine their own destiny, chart their own course out in the world. So there won't be a great deal of happiness of foreigners seeming to be preaching uh, to India as to what should happen in India. And even, I think, the opposition would see that not as necessary, necessarily an asset. Uh, but I would say that as far as Rahul Gandhi's disqualification was concerned, it was pretty outrageous. Yeah. What you should understand is that um, he's been the first Indian citizen since independence to be given the maximum sentence for criminal defamation, which is two years. And that two years happens to be the minimum period of conviction required to disqualify you from parliament. So obviously there's something about this that stinks to high heaven. Yeah. And a lot of us um, said so at the time and will continue saying so. But there is an appeals process that can go all the way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, he's, he's tried one appeal, that is, the initial conviction was at a local court, then he went to what's called a Sessions Court, next he'll go to the High Court, and finally he has the Supreme Court. So there are two more levels available to okay. question both the conviction itself and the quantum of sentence. Okay. And if one or the other is reduced, then the disqualification has to be reversed. I mean, you've in some sense also answered my next question, which was going to be that the Indian government often uses this retort of this is an internal issue to avoid international criticism. That's true. Um, and, you know, especially with, like, say, stuff like India's stance, even on Russia, Ukraine, has gotten a lot of flack. Um, and you've been quite outspoken about it. Um, and, you know, as the former uh, USG and a foreign affairs minister, what do you think about this internal issues argument when it comes to... No, well, on foreign policy, it's not an internal issue. It's a question of the stand we took in relation to an international issue and an international issue that's arguably the most important international issue facing the world right now. Um, I'm conscious that I was the only voice in Parliament that spoke against our policy. I was deeply disappointed that India did not have the courage to stand up for the principles it has always advocated since independence. The sovereignty of states, the inviolability of borders, the inadmissibility of the use of force to settle an international dispute. All of these things were forgotten when, in our first few statements at the UN, uh, we, we essentially took a very mealy-mouthed position. I'm glad to say that some of these elements then started coming in. But India articulated these as if they were sort of acts of God. At no point have they said Russia invaded. They haven't used the word Russia. They haven't used the word invasion. They haven't even used the word war in any of their speeches about what's going on. Uh, and they keep saying that this has to be settled diplomatically. There can't be a military solution. But that argument is when two sides are quarreling. Here you've got one side that's invaded the other and the other's defending itself. Uh, it becomes extremely difficult to suggest any moral equivalence. So there is a, a genuine problem with the Indian position. Um, it's been gradually shifting. Many of you know that Prime Minister Modi in a celebrated uh, speech uh, of, the, of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization with Mr. Putin, President Putin attending, turned to him and said, Mr. President, as I've said to you on the phone, this is not an era of war. And he said it in front of the world media, and that got a lot of attention. And then a few weeks later, he was at the G7 meeting in Tokyo, where he said, um, 
that um, that we must all stand unitedly against unilateral attempts to change the status quo. Now, who's changing the status quo unilaterally? Yeah. It's Russia that's marched into a country and tried to change its borders. So is this a signal to the Russians? If so, why won't India take the next step and say, strictly speaking, that Russia is in the wrong and needs to withdraw? They haven't done that. Yeah. On an arguably similar note, um, there has been a lot of criticism with countries pulling out of G20 because it's hosted in Kashmir. Um, and, you know, what are your thoughts on whether Article 370, uh, like its repeal, has worked in the past few years um, to restore stability in Kashmir? And what would Congress do if elected? So these are different issues. On the G20, we are all united that every government of India, irrespective of its political coloration, has every right to hold a meeting, uh, national or international, uh, in any part of India, and that includes Kashmir, in this case, Srinagar. So as far as we're concerned, there's no political disagreement on that. Three countries chose not to attend out of 20, and that's their privilege. They don't have to come. It's a meeting at officials' level. This is not a minister's meeting or whatever. But when it comes to Article 370, I spoke in Parliament against, against the decision of the government. And my argument was founded on two or three things. First, the very dubious constitutionality of what was done. Second, the extremely underhanded procedure used, which is that uh, you've dismissed the assembly, the elected assembly in the state. You then ask the governor, who's your appointee, to say that a particular uh, statement is acceptable. And then you say that he was speaking for Kashmir and accepting this. That, to my mind, just doesn't work. And having done that, you then um, break up the state into two, make it a union territory, suspend many democratic rights and freedoms. That, I think, was simply not on. So, so that was another problem. And my third argument in Parliament was that there's something very dangerous about this because, you know, politics and, and human life abhors a vacuum. And that if you basically shut down the space for democratic politics, what you will get in reward is undemocratic politics, which is the possible rise in militancy and terrorism. Um, it's too early to say uh, the answer to your last question as to whether this is working uh, over time. Uh, there's certainly been a reasonable amount of peace. There's been no end to militancy, but the casualty count and so on has not been appreciably higher. It's also been slightly lower in some places at some times. And um, uh, the other test, which is that would... Uh, Kashmir be a more attractive place for investors, that remains to be seen. Pledges have been made, they're yet to materialize on the ground. If a lot of investment comes into Kashmir and more Kashmiris get jobs and so on, there would be greater general acceptance. Uh, but, you know, this is a state that has been affected severely by insurgency and by, um, as a result, slowdown in, in economic development. One thing that has dramatically increased again is tourism, particularly domestic tourism from the rest of India. That has gone up so much that there is now money coming into the economy, not as investment, but as people coming, staying in hotels, buying handicrafts, buying carpets, taking cruise bo you know, boats on the Dal Lake and that sort of stuff. That's going on much more. But, you know, much of that was happening at other times as well. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. What will Congress do? Congress is being sensible and not touching this issue right now because in the larger focus on the, on the next election, I think we want to keep the election as much as possible focused on the economy. Okay. We have a situation where the very leadership that promised to create major economic growth and to create a lot of jobs has presided over the highest unemployment ever recorded since numbers that are being kept, the highest youth unemployment ever recorded. We have the world's worst figures for people between 19 and 25 in terms of employment. We have a, a dramatic decline in female labor force participation, economic growth has never recovered from the disaster of demonetization, the sudden pulling out of money from the economy. And, and there have been many, many challenges. And I think the opposition feels that this is where we can hurt the government most effectively. The government would like very much for it to be debates on, 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 on 370, on Hindu-Muslim issues, on Islamic terrorism, all the stuff that they, they love to go on about. And many of the opposition parties feel strongly that while our views on those matters have been clearly articulated in time, that we don't really want to have the entire election fought on ground the BJP feels comfortable with. We want to raise issues they're uncomfortable with, which is people looking up and saying, can we afford our daily shopping at the bazaar? Uh, can we pay for a refill for our gas cylinder? Uh, we've got a 25-year-old son hanging around the house without a job. What is he going to do tomorrow? 
These are the kinds of questions we want voters thinking about when the elections are to be held. Um, so the last question from me. Um, moving on to your biography on Dr. Bedkar, and you've, you know, you've advocated for the annihilation of caste to some extent. Um, and across, in countries abroad, we've seen uh, increased instances of caste discrimination being called out. Um, and Seattle recently passed a caste discrimination law. In California, I believe, it's contemplating one too. Yeah, yeah. And um, the UK also came close to doing so, but didn't. Um, and, you know, given that there is such a large Indian diaspora population here, uh, do you think that the country should now, the new government especially, should now be considering, uh, you know, bringing this topic up again and introducing such an anti-caste discrimination law? I think one should leave it to organically whether it happens or not. To my mind, there's absolutely nothing wrong in outlawing any kind of discrimination. Historically, when you say that there should be provisions for anti-discrimination, it should apply to your religion, to your caste, to your gender, to your sexual orientation, to your political opinion, whatever. Discrimination is discrimination. People should have a level playing field and they should not suffer for who they are. That's the basic principle. So there's nothing wrong in adding caste to the list of issues. But there are people who feel that exporting India's domestic divisions abroad is a bad and unhealthy practice, as it is sadly we've seen recently in Leicester, uh, a surfacing of Indo-Pakistani tensions, which in the past has never been. I've lived as a as a diaspora Indian myself for a very long time. And I must say that the Indians and Pakistanis got along extremely well in foreign countries. <coughs> now in recent years, we're seeing a little more of the, of the hostilities that uh, sadly have divided the subcontinent being visible abroad. Now, do you want to also get caste politics into, into foreign countries? That's a fair question. A second concern, which is more from our gov the Indian government side, not from the opposition side, is that the issue is more about pointing fingers at iniquities in Hindu society, and they bristle at that, and they, they're therefore object, saying this is a bunch of leftists who are trying to raise an issue that doesn't need to be raised, and it's, it's so irrelevant in the West, they're doing it only to hurt us back home. That kind of thinking is also there. So I would say that for all of these reasons, uh, there is a debate, a controversy about it, but purely objectively. Uh, what is discrimination? It is essentially prejudice based on something the person can't do much about, an accident of birth, uh, an accident of color, the religion that they grew up with, all of these things. So if you find that people are victims of our race, which is a thing that is outlawed in pretty much every country, discrimination based on race. So if all of these factors are to be listed, you can certainly, in my mind, I see no problem with listing caste as well. But Again, that's going to be much tougher to prove because, say, unlike race, caste is not a visible thing. Um, you can't just tell somebody's caste by looking at them. <coughs> and discrimination is never easy to prove, right? So somebody applies for a job, somebody else applies for a job, that guy gets it, this guy doesn't get it. So he says, oh, it's because the interviewer was from the same caste as that guy. And the interviewer can truly say, listen, I looked at the CV, is that a better CV? He gave a better account of himself in the interview, I picked him. How are you going to prove otherwise? So it's a tough one to demonstrate. But nonetheless, I am, as far as I'm, I'm concerned, I think that discrimination should be outlawed. And as far as possible, policies of equality, fraternity, non-discrimination should be upheld. So I have no problem with that. Um, and just a last additional question. So you spoke about how um, the Indian government right now wants to, I mean, BJP wants to continue to fight on, you know, grounds of communalism and issues of, you know, uh, these religious divides and so on and so forth. Um, and we've seen that student activist Umar Khalid has been in jail for um, a thousand days now mm -hmm. um, under the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act. And we've also seen, you know, the BK-16 and other such activists be detained. Um, and you introduced a bill to repeal the UAPA. Um, but what do you think is the realistic future um, of India's freedom of speech laws in the wake of, you know, this recent weaponization of communalism. First, I oppose the amendment to the UAPA in 2019, which is what decisively changed things. The amended UAPA says that the government has the right to describe or categorize any individual as a terrorist or a suspected yeah. terrorist. And on that basis, to detain them indefinitely without trial, without even charging them. And so far, the bulk of the people so detained have been Muslims. And I find this absolutely unacceptable, and I've said so. You can't 
take a law that undermines the basic human rights of every Indian citizen. And that, that was my... So I objected to the introduction of the bill, but of course you, you, you can make your point, but at the end of the day, the government has a crushing majority and it, it passed because they can pass anything they want to with the majority they've got. Now, having said that, the larger challenge with, with some of these uh, legislative provisions is the way in which they are applied. You don't have to actually... You, you can keep the law and really apply it in extreme cases of somebody who comes and you know, blows up a theater or whatever. Not, for example, uh, the journalist Siddiq Kapan from Kerala who was driving to Hathras in, in Uttar Pradesh because of the, the rape murder of a Dalit girl that got a lot of attention. Many politicians are going there. Legitimate story for a journalist who wants to cover. And he got detained under UAPA. I mean, and, and as you've said, many students have been done. Uh, there was a, a, a student protester, Zafuza Zagar, who was actually detained when she was pregnant. Uh, I mean, this, is, this sort of stuff was absolutely, I think, uh, pretty disgraceful. Um, the Congress party, I believe in its manifesto, should uh, mention these issues. It may not want to make them the centerpiece of the campaign. And the reason it doesn't want to do that is because the BJP has unfortunately found uh, rather fertile ground in the sort of toxin of bigotry that has been injected into the veins of our society. I mean, things that I never heard growing up, uh, ideas and thoughts that were never expressed even behind closed doors in people's living rooms, are now being declaimed from public platforms by politicians. Yeah. To my mind, that's still a shocking thing to adjust to. Uh, we are finding a number of bits of, of, of petty discrimination being expressed and conducted in daily life. Uh, it's almost as if we're back in 1947 or something. And India had spent 70 years growing in a different direction, so it, it's quite shocking. Uh, for that reason, we really need to make an effort to turn the clock back uh, to the time when Indians saw each other as brothers and sisters and not, as, not by the, the religion that they, they professed. And that's something that many of us believe is vital. I have to admit it's principally a problem in northern India. Uh, the South is largely uninfected, and, and the one state where this kind of messaging was attempted, it fell flat on its face in the local assembly elections in Karnataka. And I don't think they're going to try it too much in the South. They realize yeah. that this is not the message that works in more educated, more literate places. But they feel that they're on a winning ticket for this kind of messaging in the North. And uh, arguably, though no one ever polls on these things very precisely, Arguably, there is a majority available to espouse such bigoted views and intolerant views. And therefore, um, we feel, as I said, that we should really talk about bread and butter, dal roti business, uh, rather than, than talking about all of this in the elections, but that we should make very clear. And I hope in the manifesto, we will stick to our guns yeah. um, to sort of read down the sedition law and to read, read down the UAPA. Um, I hope that we'll do this. But... You know, again, uh, it will be used against us. When we, when we in 2019, said we would read down the sedition law, uh, uh, the ruling party went around telling people the Congress party wants to make, uh, uh, wants to protect traitors. Desh throhi ke paksh mein And the result was that we ended up uh, losing some votes on those grounds as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, should we now open the floor to audience questions? Is um, there a mic for the audience or will they have to shout? Um, the ceiling mics, they should be fine. Ceiling mics, okay. Yeah. So you play traffic cop and pick the questioners and I'll, okay. I'll give the answers. Um, sure. How about, yeah? Hi, um, Dr. Shashi, first of all, welcome to Cambridge. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Hassan. Um, Where are you from, Hassan? Thank you. So I'm talking about the conference. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm just curious, like, who am I talking to? Are you studying sociology or history or law? Hassan. Where are you from? I'm originally from Pakistan. Uh -huh. And my question is around the same, which is the topic of the conference is India on international state. So let's talk a little bit about diplomacy. Yeah, I got more questions on <laughs> domestic politics than I expected. But sure, I don't mind. So the first one is around uh, you know, how do you see the relationship playing out with Pakistan in particular, uh, especially in the wake of uh, cricketing encounters that's coming, uh, you know, the, the cricket World Cup that's approaching. Uh, do you really think that this can be? an opportunity for diplomacy for both the country to kind of sit together and resolve problems. And the second question is very simple, like, how are you such a good orator? And what, what <laughs> <laughs> On the uh, 
Indo-Pakistan relationship, again, you've touched on something that I've actually written about, and I urge you to read some of my writings on this. Uh, I feel it's very unfair that cricket is bearing the burden of the political hostility between the two countries. I am a cricket nut, uh, even though I'm a foreign policy maven. And I could understand why in the aftermath of 2611, the terrorist attack on Mumbai, which killed 166 people, that there was a suspension of relations. But I didn't expect it to last as long as it has. Because I thought eventually we'll have to get together. What's happening is that India and Pakistan are meeting in other sports. They've played hockey with each other. They've played other sports in Asian competitions, South Asian competitions. Pakistani teams have come to India. Indian teams have gone to Pakistan. But cricket, because it's so visible, so popular, so widely televised and so on, has always remained an exception. Um, and I feel, first of all, that's unfair to cricket and to all the cricket fans. But secondly, it's high time we sort of started being a little more mature about it. That's on, on both sides. Now, having said that, um, you must understand that as a general proposition, sport and cricket in particular has been used to signal a willingness that is already existing politically to make peace rather than sport becoming a cause of a willingness to make peace. If you see the difference, if the two governments already want to show friendship, then a cricket tour or the president of one going to the country of the other and watching a match, all of which have happened in the last two decades, these things have been done to symbolize a political willingness they've already decided upon. When that political willingness is not there, it gets very difficult to expect sport alone to bring that about. And that's why bilateral contests and bilateral matches have been difficult to organize. Uh, there was one exception, I believe, when there was an earthquake in Pakistan. The two teams played a match in London uh, to raise money for charity to give to the earthquake victims. But with, with that exception, there's actually been not too many opportunities, except in international tournaments. And so India and Pakistan have played each other in the World Cup many times. Now, the problem is when one or the other country is hosting. So right now, Pakistan is scheduled to host the Asia Cup, and we have a situation where the Indian team won't go to Pakistan. And India is supposed to hold the, host the World Cup, and Pakistan says we're willing to go to India, but not if they don't come to play in our tournament. So at the moment, there are talks going on. There even were conversations in the last informal ICC meeting in the margins of the World Test Championship final. Um, the Pakistanis, uh, the Pakistani president of the cricket board, Najam Sethi, has proposed what's called a hybrid formula. She says he understands the political problem, and I think everyone on both sides understands how bad things are. But he says, why don't we, in order to establish the fact that it's Pakistan's Asia Cup and Pakistan is hosting, we'll have the first few matches in Pakistan and India need not come. Then we'll relocate to a neutral country, let's say the UAE, and there all the remaining matches will be played. So he was asked, what happens if Pakistan reaches the final? He says, we hope it'll be in Pakistan, but if India's in the final, then maybe it'll be in a neutral country. So he's being... <laughs> I'm on side of finding a solution so that both sides play. So whatever solution they're willing to agree, this is the hybrid formula, so-called. And I'm told that the Indians, um, there's some Indians who are against, some Indians are willing to be accommodative. The conversation is going on. Now, if this hybrid formula works, though, India will not agree to the hybrid formula for the World Cup. It's India's World Cup and they want to have it. You know, so that's, I think the last one was jointly hosted by India and Sri Lanka. The one before that in the subcontinent was jointly hosted by all three countries in 96. Um, so I think they're going to have a fairly strong view that on this, uh, if we make a compromise with Pakistan for the Asia Cup, Pakistan will have to come to India for the World Cup. Now again, Pakistan will have to make a political decision. Pakistan is also heading towards elections. Uh, there's a lot of political tension domestically within your country. There's a problem. There's even a further joker in the pack, which is that it's not impossible that the ruling government in India could advance the general elections, you know, in the parliamentary system. The date of the election is the last possible date. So you have to have an election by April, May of 2024, because the new parliament has to be seated by the 26th of May, I believe it is, of 2024. But in India, because such a vast country, the election cycle will start about three months before the New parliament has to sit, there's a code of conduct established and campaigning starts and the voting is staggered over seven or eight phases over six or seven weeks. So it's a, it's a huge exercise, uh, the largest democratic franchise in the world. If Mr. Modi decides that it's to his political advantage to hold the elections in November, along with three or four state elections that right now he looks likely to lose, 
And he may hope that people coming to vote for him for national office will vote for his party in those states as well. See, if he does that, say, in November, there's a general election. Then from September, when the World Cup is supposed to be held, we're going to have problems. There's going to be massive political issues. So I don't know how all this is going to play out. As of now, I think we are still on course for a compromise. And I hope, like heck, for all of our sakes, that we will find an acceptable compromise that both Pakistan will agree to and India will participate in, that the Asia Cup will go ahead on that basis, and thereafter Pakistan will be an honored guest in India for the World Cup. But fingers crossed is all I can say. Um, let's move on. We don't have a lot of time. I'm sorry. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, how about... Alternate genders, I think. Oh, no fairness. You want to go ahead? Thank you, Dr. Tarun. So, I am I'm studying public policy and running school of economics. Mr. Doctor. You missed my talk there. Yeah. Tut, tut. <laughs> yeah. So, I have a question on uh, basically, uh, who do you think is the way out for India to overthrow its economy against China, also in terms of leading the world in international politics? And is the formula adopted so far working or? Do you see we need a stark change going forward? I'm afraid it's, 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 it's a problematic question you've raised because there are multiple ways of looking at it. There's no doubt that India has done a number of things right. Major infrastructure improvements uh, by the Modi government, roads, ports, highways, uh, even investment in railways is now picking up, which had, hadn't been in earlier. Um, the difficulty, and there is a tech stack which everyone raves about. I saw a, a Pakistani video blogger raving about the fact that he felt he'd stepped into the future when he went to India and saw chaiwalas with uh, QR codes on their carts, uh, which is true. You can just flash your phone and, and you know, PTM QR code and you, 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 the money is transferred and a little beep goes off and the chaiwala knows you paid. It's, it's quite an interesting system, uh, which is now widely being used and so on. And that, that really boggles the mind of many other developing countries. So those things are moving well. But the key strategy that India announced many years ago was make in India, that is manufacturing. And there we've simply not been able to get off the ground. Um, there's practically no significant new investment in manufacturing by private companies. There's one famous one that's been talked about a lot, and that is that Apple announced that make 25% of the iPhones in India. But they aren't even at 10% yet. It's just slowly getting underway. <clears throat> but meanwhile, with those companies leaving China for all sorts of reasons, both political and economic, higher labor costs and so on, have not been coming to India. They're going to either Vietnam or Thailand or Mexico. And the result, therefore, is that India has not been able to prove a capacity to attract investment in manufacturing, which in turn alone will generate the jobs we need to generate. I mean, there's nothing more dangerous for any society than large numbers of unemployed young men, I'm sorry to say. And we are, we're, we're getting there. And we need desperately to find work that soaks up people. But we haven't yet uh, achieved either the manufacturing scale, the productivity, the efficiency. Uh, we don't have enough skilled laborers, uh, laborers to offer, so when people hire them, there's going to be a bit of on-the-job training to be done. All of these things we need to fix urgently. So I would not give the government a pass yet. I don't think we're doing everything right. I don't disagree with the vision because you need something that will absorb a lot of people. One more area which I believe they should have emphasized much more, which also absorbs a lot of people, including semi-skilled and unskilled labor, is tourism. Um, if they would only clean up the tourism sector much more and make it easier, more attractive, lower taxes, you would actually find, you know, there's plenty of capacity required. Hotels at all levels, budget hotels and hostelries. Because, you know, it doesn't take you a higher education to be a, a doorman or a gardener or a waiter. And there'd be people flocking for jobs in these areas. So that's another area they could have done. They haven't adopted that strategy yet. So these are things I believe that will actually help bring us uh, more. Because, you know, improving the economy is not just about GDP numbers, right? Or even per capita income. If Mukesh Ambani walked into this room, all our per capita incomes would go up immediately. <laughs> but the moment he walked out, we'd be just as poor as before. So... Per, per capita income is a very misleading figure. What I want to see is people having jobs and being able to fulfill their own dreams. Um, do you want to have to take your pick? No, 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 it's up to you. <laughs> you, you draw the short straw on that one. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'm Anisha Manjana from India, working with Don Chan here in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, uh, working for two years, uh, there's a concept of Jigar in India, why there are frameworks of policies we abide by. To avoid red, red tapism in India, what policies can be brought about? I know 
it cannot be extinguished, but what can we do to make it better? Oh, I think we just have to scrap half the laws in the country. And I must say the government made a bit of a start on it, but it's still absurd that it takes um, 112 days on average to start a business in India, when in the U.S. it takes three. Uh, I think in Singapore it takes five. I mean, you know, uh, the countries we can learn from. There is absolutely no reason to have as many procedures, regulations, and so on as we do. We also have far too many laws on the books that permit inspectors to come and harass companies and businesses and so on. We don't have a credible Investor Protection Act, though there are some trade agreements that are built in investor protections. But domestically, we don't have one. There's a lot that needs to be done. I, I'm, I'm very much on this matter, uh, on the sort of rights of my party. I want to see massive liberalization of, regular, of, of, of uh, regulations, procedures particularly, uh, and, and rules, because I think if we don't open up, Indians are actually very entrepreneurial. It's remarkable how well they've done abroad as entrepreneurs and how few there have been in India. And now Mr. Modi's government is rightly boasting of the number of startups that are coming up and the fact that we've got a hundred unicorns created in the last five years, which is not bad for a country uh, with as, much, as many challenges as ours has. But overwhelmingly, these are in the tech space, and it's slightly illusory because tech has only employed 10 million people in the last 30 years put together, and that's not good enough. We need to have economic growth that employs people. I keep going on about that because, honestly, as somebody who has to go out and get votes from people, I know how important this is. People need jobs. Without jobs, there's no hope, and with hope, everything is possible. Um, maybe one from this side. Would you like to? Hi, I'm the chair. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. Um, um, thank you so much for the talk. I think you mentioned something about how um, BJP's politics and their kind of um, approach to, I guess, bigotry and all of that, that those policies aren't really working down south. Um, I guess my question is, especially when looking at Tamil Nadu and Kerala, um, what are the issues that voters are caring about then? Um, and what are the kind of focuses that the local governments are having there? What are the issues that sectarianism is about? Is that what you said? No, no, no. I said what are the issues that, like, the local government, the state governments in South India are focusing on, which are outside, you know, the policies you were talking about, BJP is trying to battle on, which have fallen flat in South India? No, uh, the, the difference uh, on, the, on the issue of sectarianism between North and South is partially a question of, um, of history. Uh, the histories are different. And therefore, the chip on the shoulder that many northern Indian Hindutva politicians have is simply not there in the south. I mean, for example, you take Kerala. I think I heard you mention Kerala. Is that right? Uh, in Kerala, for example, Islam did not come with the sword. Um, we had been trading with what is today the Arab world for several centuries before Islam, before the Prophet. And these were communities that would come with the, with the favorable winds, stay in Kerala, do their trade, take the favorable winds back, and they would keep coming and going. They were familiar folks. And they said, hey, you know what's happening in our, in our area? We've got this new prophet, and this is his message. You know, the message was so well received that a, a Kerala king actually got on a ship and went off to the Gulf to meet, to, to meet the prophet in Mecca, and he met the prophet. He never made it back. He died on the peninsula, but he left behind the most amazing evidence of his visit, which is Kerala coconut trees, not native to the Arabian Peninsula, that are growing even today in Oman, south of Salala. Now, that's the kind of openness, right? So the oldest mosque outside the Middle East, outside Palestine, is in Kerala, in Kodungalur, because again, a bunch of Muslims who are coming, going, etc., said, hey, we need a place to worship. And King said, oh, there's an old temple that no one's using. You can have it now. And they quietly went to this abandoned temple. There's still an amazing, huge Hindu brass lamp at the entrance. I mean, the thing has been renovated and rebuilt. But this was in the 7th century. Um, so we're talking um, 14 centuries ago and that this temple has been, uh, this mosque has been in existence. Uh, I don't know any Kerala Muslim who feels a minority complex in Kerala. He, he feels just the same as anyone else. The same with the Christians, which are also a significant minority in Kerala. So for them, this kind of talk is bizarre. But in the north, it's easy still to rile passions up with memories of partition, memories of, of assaults, massacres, pillaging of temples, all of those things, which were a particular North Indian historical experience. The argument should not be whether those things happened or whether bad things were done. The argument is okay, so they were done in the past. When are you going to grow up and live in the future? When are you going to think about the present? Uh, instead of you know, burdening today's Indian Muslims, with the legacy of anything that anyone from their faith did badly a thousand years ago, 
let's just move on. That's the, the attitude of most people in the South. Now, that's the broader issue. You asked what are Southern governments focused on? Everyone has local issues. So um, in Kerala, we have a severe unemployment problem. That's a major issue. Uh, every state has, has, has ease of doing business issues. Corruption is a major problem. Many of the Southern states, massive amounts of corrupt. Just as the economies are growing, uh, there's also more money around. And a lot of it is being misspent and, and misappropriated. So everyone, every state has its own local issues. Uh, when it comes to the state elections, it's almost inevitably local issues that dominate. And we saw that in Karnataka quite recently. When it comes to national elections, um, the central government may have a very effective strategy to drive the election in a certain direction. The first election was about the Gujarat model and how the whole of India was going to be like Gujarat Inc. The second election was was all about national security because the Pakistanis did the ruling party the very great favor of blowing up uh, an army convoy in, in, in Pulbama and killing 40 soldiers. So the entire election, which was, we were trying to make it about the economy, turned on its head and became an election about national security, about terrorism uh, uh, from across the border. And that was the end of that for the opposition. And the, the, the ruling party got a bigger majority. So I'm not saying that these issues will necessarily be what comes up tomorrow. Who knows what can happen between now and the election. But as of now, I would say the principal challenge for the ruling party in every state is going to be its handling of the economy, which people in their daily life experiences may have reason to question. Uh, start. Now there's a bit of gender bias creeping in. <laughs> Got to give a guy a chance to. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm Safa. I'm, I was born in Bangladesh. I just wanted to ask um, whether you can envision in India, which is more free from like lasting influences of British Empire, for example, like the prestige to like knowing English and like the economic opportunities that offers, and whether you think that restructure India and South Asia in general um, from. Yeah, I mean, I, there are politicians in India who, who declaim against English, who want everyone to speak in Hindi who are proud of the fact that Indian ministers under Mr. Modi have spoken in Hindi at the United Nations, all of that. But, you know, I find in my experience, most of the politicians who attack English in public for, for, for whatever political agenda they want to pursue, usually send their kids to English medium schools <laughs> and often even send them abroad afterwards. So um, English is, in everyone's reckoning, an instrument for advancement and opportunity, especially in, an, in a globalized world, um, it'll be an asset in whatever job you do. If you're working only in India, you're no longer in a position to work only in your mother tongue. Even if you know English only as a second language, uh, if your business is internationally, we're dealing maybe with Germans who also know English as their second language. And we're dealing with Italians who know English as their second or third language. It doesn't matter. Everyone will have something in common. It's an asset. You don't throw away an asset uh, for no good reason. So I think that... Um, if at all, I mean, I know that many of you know that I'm strongly associated with a, a strong rejection of the colonial legacy and the, the motives of, of, of the British colonial uh, presence in India. But nonetheless, I'm not in a hurry to discard English. I think it's extremely useful, and I think it's useful for my own country's growth and advancement. It wasn't brought to India to help us. It was brought to India to help them. But we've got it now, and we're not going to let it go as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> My name is Junaid. Um, I'm a doctor. I work in Cambridge. I'm actually not too far from where your constituency is. I'm from Kollam in Kerala. Oh my gosh, hi, welcome. So my question really, uh, I know about India, but my question is more on identity. Uh, my question is because I know that you've been born in England. You've spent quite a lot of time abroad. Uh, you've been your undergrad study in India. So for you, uh, you've you possibly during your younger days had exposure and was possibly a global citizen more than you would consider, you know, as technically as an Indian to spend time in India. So did you at any point have an identity crisis? And in a sense, like, you know, and when did you decide? Was it your long-term time to come back into Indian politics? Or was it something that, you know, culminated later into your life after you? Thank you, Junaid. No, I actually have written about this uh, in the prologue to my book, The Battle of Belonging, which in this country is called The Struggle for India's Soul. Uh, I was born in London, but my parents moved to India when I was two, two and a half years old. And in fact, 
they had never seen themselves really as permanent migrants to, to, to England. My father came here as a student. Uh, the way in which many Keralites would go off to Delhi or Bombay or Calcutta, and London was one of those part of the metropole kind of thing. And, and um, uh, he was representing a, a, an Indian newspaper called The Statesman in London at a time when all the statesmen's managers in India were Englishmen. He was waiting for an Englishman to retire so he could go back to India. And when the Bombay office opened up, he went back to head the Bombay office. And so I grew up with my parents in Bombay, then high school in Calcutta where he got transferred. And then on my own in Delhi, I went to college. So I, I had a pan-Indian upbringing, um, at the end of which I got a scholarship to go to graduate school in the States. And on the way, I was going to stop in England. And I remember waiting for a visa at the British Deputy High Commission in Calcutta uh, in the, I mean, the, the entry permit is what it was called in those days, not a visa. Um, and uh, while I was in the waiting room with, you know, 50 or 60 others, I suddenly get a, so my name is called out. Uh, and I was told the Deputy High Commissioner wants to see you. So uh, I was a bit astonished. What did I do wrong? Did I fill in the form? Uh, you know, was there something about me they didn't like? And so I went to see the deputy. I was received in his governor's office. Uh, and he said, so you're born in London. Of course, you know, there was uh, the documentation attached. I said, yes. He said, we can't give you uh, uh, an entry permit. I said, why not? He said, because you're entitled to a passport. And I said, but I don't want a passport. And he said, I mean, he, he was, he was, his mouth practically dropped. He said, I don't know an Indian who doesn't want an Indian British passport. And I said, look, I look in the mirror and I see an Indian. I'm not going to change. Uh, can you give me this? And he had to explain that it was against the British rules to give an entry document to somebody who was entitled to a passport. So he said, you just go, take a copy of your birth certificate with you, but they will let you into the country on the basis of the fact that you were born in London and they won't even stamp your passport. And so that's how I went the first few times. Things have changed since. I mean, Britain, not in India, but the fact is that that was when I had to seriously interrogate myself as to who I was and what I wanted to be. I was fairly international minded uh, as an Indian, but I never had any doubt. And, you know, afterwards, uh, when I joined the United Nations, uh, I was able to have a, a, a wide exposure to international life. Uh, but I never lost a sense of my rootedness in India. I never felt any inclination to take any other residence or nationality. Um, I attract, found many things attractive in many other countries. Uh, but I felt that being at home somewhere doesn't mean that you want to become that. And I always felt the only place where I could have been in my own mind, totally comfortable in my own skin, was in my own country. And that's, that's really the answer to your question. So when at the end of, uh, well, at the age of 51, when I had spent cumulatively something like 34 years of my life abroad, so very much more than half my life, um, I decided to come back to India. I knew I was taking a leap into the unknown. Uh, not the unknown, really, but because I'd visited every year and I read up on India all the time. I was one of those idiots who in the pre-internet days used to get a daily newspaper mailed to me. It would arrive seven days after the date in which it was published, but, but I would read, you know, Indian news all the time. Uh, so I, I didn't feel I was coming to a, to a strange country. It was my country, and I had relatives and classmates and friends and all that. But still, it was the country to which I felt I belonged. And I still feel that even though I've been through a very rough time since I've come back with various Agni Parikshas, as we call it. But, uh, but I've, um, I, I've, I've, that issue I've, I've, not, uh, I've not changed my mind on. I, I am Indian, and uh, if I'm a citizen of anywhere, it's a citizen of India. Um, have a question. Um, I'm Mariam. I study psychology. You'll have to be a little louder, Mariam. I'm getting old and deafer. I study sociology and social anthropology. And yeah, louder, please. Oh, no, I, study, I study sociology and social. Sociology, yeah. Um, I'm actually one of the presidents of Kerala Sok, and most of the rest of the committee are here as well. So we're very excited. Uh, she's the president of Kerala Sok, and most of the committee are. Here. Oh, there's a Kerala Sok. Yeah. Great. Okay. Congratulations, Madam President. <laughs> um, in light of all these racial and economic issues, it often seems like environmental issues are forgotten. And, um, um, in light of um, racial issues, it feels like environmental issues are forgotten. Do you want to come down? No, no, it's all right. It's okay. I've got a very good translator here. I had to read an article on like e-waste and how India is often used as a dumping ground and like a recycling plant for the West. Um, I was wondering like um, what like the impacts of this forgotten legally gray sector and is this like an issue that Congress cares about? 
e-waste oh. and India being used as a dumping ground mm -hmm. in a lot of foreign countries. I'll be honest with you and say I haven't a clue about e-waste and, and whether India is a dumping ground. There have been historically some problems. For example, we were a dumping ground for, for uh, rusty old ships that were being decommissioned and they were being taken apart in India, in Gujarat, in fact. Um, it was a very lucrative business, but it was deeply bad, both for the environment and for the health of the workers who were dismantling these ships within those days, asbestos and all sorts of carcinogens and chemicals in the ships. Uh, I'm assuming there'll be similar problems on e-waste, but I, I, haven't, I haven't come across this yet. As a matter now that you've mentioned it, I will try and look it up a little more. Uh, but certainly we should not be a dumping ground for anybody else's garbage, and I agree with you. First of all, we are hopeless at dealing with our own garbage. So the last thing I need to do, I think, as, as an Indian is to import other people's garbage as well, uh, because, you know, our, our cities are really monuments to inefficiency when it comes to waste management and waste disposal of any kind. Uh, any kind of garbage. So adding to it is, is utter folly. I, I will try and find out more about this. Thank you. Um, last question. No, no, we, oh yeah, yeah. We have seven minutes. <laughs> Unless right. you want to. I can stay till, I can stay till 5.30. How far Brilliant. is seven minutes? Um, not that far, five okay. minutes. Max. Five minutes, all right, go ahead. Uh, so seven minutes left, okay. Brilliant. Um, I'm Akshita, I study English, and I'm from Mumbai. Um, so I was wondering, there was an investigation last week about um, how the Indian government had raided three offices that had opposed Adani's coal mine projects. So I was wondering whether what, what the opposition's strategy or whether what the opposition's concerns are about the government's um, <coughs> dealings with business tycoons and giants in that country. Well, the opposition has made a campaign out of the crony capitalism of the government. And, and Rahul Gandhi himself has been making a lot of speeches about how the only people who have benefited from economic growth are the friends of the government and so on. So that's been a big theme. But on coal specifically, I don't think there's a huge difference uh, because though we all know that coal is bad for the environment, we also know there are still about 250 million Indians who cannot take for granted what everyone in the West can, that is to flick a switch on a wall and be bathed with light. Because the truth is that we in India do not have 24-7 electricity in much of the country, and there are many places which are not connected at all. And to get there, we will still need to rely on thermal for another generation. So coal is not something we can dispense with, whether it's domestically mined coal or imported coal. Now, of course, you can import coal and let somebody else suffer the environmental consequences of coal mining, and some of that is happening. But by and large, people tend to feel we should take advantage of whatever coal we've got access to, and that includes our own. And therefore, um, I don't think there's going to be a huge amount of political difference if the opposition comes to power on whether we should continue coal mining or not. But the question of how fair the system is and whether some people are benefiting unduly because of their proximity to the current government, on that issue, the, the opposition and the Congress in particular has been quite outspoken. <coughs> I think we have time for another question. Um, mm -hmm. um, how about, yeah. Hi, I'm Andrea. I study, Could you be loud? I study political science. I could um, raise another original family to look by God. I just want to get your thoughts on the NRI community and the role that you play in this development and the role in the show. Right, with the NRI community, I mean, I, I remember writing a book 25 years ago, 26 years ago, and I called India from Midnight to the Millennium, where I said, what does NRI stand for? Not really Indian or never relinquished India? Because there's a little bit of both in them, you know. The, there's, there's a sense in which, because they live abroad and they imbibe the the environment in which they live, they're not really Indian anymore, but they also um, never relinquished India. They sort of hold on uh, to their attachment to the motherland and so on. Uh, over the years, I, I came up with uh, a different one. I said, they are really the National Reserve of India because NRIs have been a tremendous asset to India in standing up for Indian interests in foreign countries and lobbying foreign governments and becoming influential players in foreign countries and thereby influencing uh, those countries' policies towards India. Um, the fact that Indians are influential in the politics of Britain, of, of America, uh, of more and more countries, the diaspora has become a major asset. Having said that, there is some concern about the extent to which the political divisions in India are getting mirrored amongst the NRIs abroad. And that will certainly undercut their effective influence, because if you've got one set of Indians uh, telling the local government to support India on a particular issue, another set of Indians saying, no, no, don't support them, they're terrible people, uh, you might actually have 
in effect a net sort of standoff which will not help India very much. So it is, it is a problem. Uh, as long as it's consensual issues about India and supporting India, we can all be happy. But I don't want to see too many tensions and, and differences of opinion dividing the, the Indian community abroad. How can you contribute to develop in the same old time-honored way? Send money home, um, <laughs> help reverse the brain drain. Um, uh, a lot of people who, um, who came abroad to study and stayed on have also started now setting up companies in India and sometimes going back themselves. All that's very welcome. Um, give donations to your alma mater if you studied in India. I know you didn't, but others who might have done, they could do that. Uh, there's a lot that they can do. Stay engaged, stay involved, stay supportive. Uh, we've had a major progressive uh, literacy campaign by an NRI organization called Pratham that came in, did a lot of work in, in, in basic literacy promotion and education reform. So there are things that people can do, especially if they're organized at a big scale, bring in lots of money. I think Pratham raised hundreds of millions of dollars in America, so they weren't a small player. When they came in, they came in big, and they could make an impact on, in a politically non-controversial area like, a, like you know, uh, literacy and education. So these are the kinds of things NRIs have been doing, are able to do, and should do more of, in my view. Okay, one last question, and then I really will have Let's to... Let's indulge. Um, yeah? So, uh, coming back to the topic and say flipping tables on the much less. What do you think should be the role of societies like the Cambridge Modulus and other societies that the university is brought, for, say, Indian politics and the South South Asian Union politics? How do you think they... What should be the role played by the Cambridge Modulus? Is that your question? What can we do? If Give us some advice. If you had to design an event card for the Cambridge Modulus... <laughs> <laughs> you really said, let's put you in comedy. <laughs> Well, look, I think, I, think, I think the fact that you all exist and you, you provide a forum for people who are from the subcontinent or are interested in the subcontinent is already a big thing. Mind you, you're not unique anymore. You were in 1891. But now every, every campus has either a South Asian Students Association or various Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi associations, whether it's in England or America and most other places. So um, I, I think what you could do is encourage healthy discussion, healthy cooperation, cultural activities, forums on common problems, whether it's economic ones, employment issues, problems of youth. There are lots of issues where there are problems that transcend the borders and, and, and that at the same time uh, require people like you who care, who know, who are engaged to find solutions. Um, can you be force for peace uh, in the subcontinent, particularly amongst the present two countries, I'm not so sure. You certainly can be a voice, one more voice for it, but the problems are probably bigger than a bunch of even capable, intelligent, idealistic students sitting in Cambridge can, can resolve. But you can create networks of friendship and cooperation and mutual understanding that might serve the subcontinent well in, in decades to come. So. Uh, those are all things that we can do. I and mean, I, I certainly am one of those who, who believes very much in, in peaceful coexistence and good relations. I chaired the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Indian Parliament for five years. We wrote a report, even despite all the tensions after 2611 in Mumbai, uh, saying that people-to-people -people contact should be uh, resumed, even though government-to-government uh, -government contract, contact was, was difficult, or in fact, had been held in abeyance because of the level of mistrust that had arisen uh, in India for Pakistan after what happened then. Um, and I think that people-to-people -people contact is something that you folks are naturally all about. Campuses are all about that. So uh, build on that. Thank you all very much. That hour went very quickly. Thank you.